Well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm gratified to see so many people have come out to hear about diamonds. Um, unfortunately, I'm going to disappoint all the ladies in the audience straight away because the diamonds I'm going to be talking about are not jewellery. Uh, and then I'm going to uh, upset all the gentlemen as well because uh, diamonds also possibly might refer to a well-known brand of beer. Um, but there was a reason for putting in this particular uh, slide because uh, if we think about this advert, uh, the double diamond which is mentioned there is actually a trade name. So it essentially it identifies a product and it identifies a company and it also serves, of course, to differentiate uh, one company's product against their competitors. But on the other hand, that doesn't actually tell us anything about the people who actually worked within, say, the brewery to actually make the product. So the people who actually did all the hard work are essentially anonymous. We don't know anything about them. Now, here um, we have a, a slightly different case of marks. The, these are stonemasons' marks, and uh, these can be found quite uh, widely around places like old uh, historic buildings, cathedrals, this sort of thing. And in fact, uh, when they're uh, doing the work on, the, um, on Big Ben and the, the Houses of Parliament now, where they're replacing stonework, uh, each piece of stone there will have a mason's mark on it. Now that mark is personal to one particular person. So if, if you uh, are doing research on an old building or you're having to restore an old building and you find several pieces of stone marked with a particular mark, you may be fairly certain that all those pieces of stone were carved by one person. It was their signature. Now, unfortunately, I suspect in the case with stonemasons' marks, certainly old ones, uh, we have no records uh, to actually associate those marks with an individual craftsman. So really, uh, what I'm trying to say in a, in a rather roundabout way is that the mark, which is the double diamond that I'm going to be talking about today, actually is a personal mark which was owned or used by a craftsman. And in a few lucky cases, we're actually able to identify that person by name and find out something about him. So that, that's basically the, the starting point of the story. Now, I'm going to concentrate on uh, a local Sheffield company, William Marples. Um, it was a, a big company in its day. It's no longer uh, in existence. It's now, I believe, part of Erwin Tours. Um, but it started really um, in the early 1800s. But by 1909, which is where this picture is taken from, one of their catalogues, uh, they were a very prominent uh, company in Sheffield who made a wide range of hand tools, which is what the Hawley Collection is about. Um, and not only that, but they bought in other sorts of tools which they didn't make themselves um, and sold those. So they both manufactured uh, tools and also sold them on behalf of other people. So I want, I want to just spend a few minutes just tracing a bit of the history of Marples before we move on to uh, perhaps more interesting things in a way. So I'm just trying to set the scene. So this shows um, what purports to be uh, the Marples factory uh, in 1909. Uh, it's a typical sort of late Victorian uh, advertisement. A lot, lots of uh, people had catalogues which showed how grandiose their works were or their, their manufacturing sites. Um, there's quite a lot of sort of artistic license which goes into these, I might add. But Let's try and point out to you where this was situated. So along here, uh, this is Westfield Terrace, which goes between uh, West Street and Division Street. So uh, West Street would be along here. Uh, this is Westfield Terrace. And then uh, the part down here is Division Street. And then round the corner, uh, there's Rockingham Street. So this works was quite big in its heyday, and it occupied probably half a as the Americans would say, half a block. Um, now, the part that we will be interested in later on uh, is actually not shown on here, 
uh, which certainly was in existence in 1909. And this is what makes me think that this is uh, an engraving from a somewhat earlier date. Um, but it has all the typical hallmarks of these sorts of pictures from the period. Uh, the figures and the horses and carts are very tiny and the buildings look enormous. So it's meant to make the, the works look very impressive. So typical advertising, really. Well, here's a, a, a timeline for uh, uh, William Marples. Uh, I'm sorry, there's quite a lot of words. Most of my slides won't have lots of words on. There'll be mainly pictures, so you'll be relieved to hear. But um, William Marple Sr. Uh, was born, I think, in somewhere around uh, Baslow in probably 1770-something. But I don't know much about him, but I think he was a sort of odd job man come carpenter, and probably he, he might have been a blacksmith on the side. Um, but he eventually moved to Sheffield. Um, and then uh, in 1828, his son William, who's the one we're really going to be talking about here, uh, I've called him junior to differentiate from senior, um, he, he, was start, uh, he started a business with the help of his father in a very small way. Uh, and they were making, uh, I guess, edge tools. And that means tools with a cutting edge. Um, but the sort of things that they might have made would be a drill bits for brace and bit for drilling holes in wood. Um, and also they made ice skates of all things. But again, an ice skate has a, a blade on the bottom to, to, to you know, cut through the ice, as it were. So he started, obviously, in a fairly small way, probably supplied things to his father as well, I suspect. And then gradually over time, obviously, the business picked up and he got more men and he gradually took over more and more premises and, until he was sort of more or less occupying the ones shown on that, on that previous picture. Um, from our point of view, though, the more significant thing is that probably by 1880, something like that, he was uh, making but also selling, in other words, buying in and then selling on, quite a wide range of tools. Um, and one of the things which there was always a demand for was uh, uh, planes for shaping and planing wood. Because, of course, at that time, uh, you couldn't go like you can today to B&Q and go and get a piece of wood of a particular size and shape and dimensions and everything, and, and smoothness. Everything had to be done by hand, and um, this was all done using wooden planes at that time because really metal planes were only just about starting to come in um, to manufacture. So if I just, I, I was going to wander across there, but I can't, but um, then if I can show you, if, if, I mean, if you can see my, my pointer, but um, there's, there's one about halfway down the table, which you'll be able to see later on, would be a typical uh, jack plane of that period. It's, it's a large plane, and it would be the sort of made of all work. So you, you use this for planing rough bits of timber down to size and getting them smooth and so on. And so um, that, that was the sort of thing that uh, there was quite a, a big demand for because everybody used them and they were used all day long in, in, in woodworking shops to even make things like floorboards, for example. Um, you imagine how many floorboards would be required, especially as building work got seriously underway in the 1880s and so on. So a lot of people were spending their days just planing bits of wood to the right size. Or if you wanted to make a, a sash window frame or a door frame, you know, all these bits of wood had to be planed to size so they would fit together. So um, because marbles didn't actually make their own planes, they made probably the irons which went into them, the cutting irons, because that was an edge, an edge tool, if you like, and just a piece of metal with a, a sharp cutting edge on it. They would have made those, but they didn't make the wooden parts which the irons fitted into. So they seem to have got into some sort of arrangement with a London company called John Mosley. Now, they've been around since 1730 making planes, and we have a lot of their planes in our collection. Um, but Marples had this arrangement whereby um, you could buy uh, planes from Mosley's. And the thing about this from Marples' point of view was that those planes were made in London, and they were marked London, and there was a certain cachet associated with that because it was assumed that these were automatically superior products. 
and that meant that Marpus could sell them at higher prices. So it, it was good business that they, they had this arrangement. Um, but eventually, they took over the company when it was starting to sort of fall by the wayside a bit. And essentially, uh, Marples then set up their own plane-making operation in Sheffield, and this was actually on Rockingham Street. Uh, but they had no people who were capable of making the planes. They didn't have the skills to do it. After all, Marples was not really a woodworking company. It was a metalworking company. So what they had to do was to recruit uh, so-called plane hands. Plane hands are people who make planes. Um, so they, they took some from the original premises of Moseley in London, and then they had to recruit from other places. And so they looked around at other uh, companies in the country who made planes, and these were predominantly uh, in York, Birmingham, uh, Hull, uh, and, and Glasgow. So oft, often these were places sort of around the edge of the country because a lot of their product was exported. So this is a very significant point, and I've highlighted Birmingham there because I'm going to talk about some people who originally came from Birmingham later on. Um, surprisingly, they were still making wooden planes at Marples until about uh, just after 1965. Uh, the last ones were made by hand in 65, but then they turned to mass production techniques and, and they made some what I would call machine-made planes uh, out at Dronfield, which is where they'd, been work, uh, they'd moved to by that stage. So production of mach even machine-made wooden planes was finished in about 1970, and then um, Marple sort of fell on hard times, really, and uh, they were merged with uh, C&J Hampton, which was then the Record Ridgeway Group, and then now you can still buy tools which are marked Marples, uh, primarily things like chisels, um, but these are made by Irwin Tools in Sheffield. So there's a long history there um, of, of, of tool making in Sheffield. I now want to move on to the products. And, and, and of course, I said that Marples made many sorts of tools and sold many sorts of tools, but in this talk, I only want to talk about wooden planes because really that is my specialization. Um, again, this is a, 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 a page from their 1909 catalogue. And this shows you uh, pictures of, of some of the planes, the types of planes that they made. But I'm only going to concentrate on two types here. Um, the first one is the, the triplane, the big planes, which is the one I was talking about earlier. So these are the maids of all work, heavy, heavy duty shaping of wood. Uh, the thing about these, though, is that they were, um, have been known for a very long period of time. They've been made certainly since at least 1700, and earlier, I would suspect. Um, primarily in London. But the thing was that these planes were worked to death. They were used every day. Because they're made of wood, they tend to wear out, basically. The, the, the bottom of the plane wears out because it's wood, rubbing against wood. And so these planes wore out, and at that stage, they just used them for firewood because all these planes are made of beech wood, which is a fairly close-grained wood. It, it's hard wearing. But by the time, you know, the, the depth... The depth here of the plane had sort of shrunk to about half the depth of its original. The plane wasn't very useful after that. You couldn't, you couldn't do uh, accurate work with it. So they usually got chopped up and put on the, um, on the fire in, in, in the workshop or, or wherever. So not many of them have survived, at least not old ones. You, you can see, still see modern ones from the sort of uh, middle part of the last century. Um, but the planes I'm going to be talking about here uh, the other sort, which are these down here, which are called moulding planes. Now, moulding planes um, were the sort of um, uh, top end of the craft market, if you like. These, these are the ones that were used by cabinet makers. So if you wanted to have a piece of furniture or you wanted to have a, an elegant doorway or an elegant door in your house, then often you would adorn... Uh, those pieces of wood making up the door or the window frame or the door jam, you would, you would decorate it with a decorative moulding around the edge. So if you imagine this, this door frame here, it would have a, a very ornate sort of um, plain uh, shape on it. And this is known as a moulding. And um, these 
fashions for the shapes of these mouldings that you used changed over the centuries. So the, f the fashions for how, how doors and windows and so on looked in, say, 1700 or earlier obviously changed between then and, say, 1900. Uh, probably by 1900, some of these moulding shapes have got uh, less sort of ornate. And so what happened is, the, is that since the mouldings went out of fashion, that meant that these planes were no longer used. And so they got put on one side, put under the bench, hidden away somewhere. Oh, we might use that one day again, but they were forgotten about. And so uh, unlike these, where most early planes have not survived, with these, many early planes have survived. And the earliest ones that we know about in this country were some which were recovered from uh, King Henry VIII's flagship, the Mary Rose. There were some planes which were recovered on that. And when, when people looked at these, they realised that they looked very similar in style and everything else to ones which were made 300 years later. The style didn't really change uh, because the shape of the human hand doesn't change. So because the hand has to hold the planes, then what was a comfortable shape 300 years ago is still a comfortable shape today. So these are not rare and you can still find them in antique centres and car boot sales and things like that. Um, and I'll have more to say about those later on. Now I mentioned that the moulding planes um, were responsible for um, making lots of different shapes and mouldings and we'll have a look at that in a minute. But uh, again this is taken from the uh, 1909 uh, Marples catalogue and it shows the inside of their plane making shop. So this had been only just set up in 19, probably 1905, something like that, 1906. But we can see quite a few people in the shop, there's what, about 10, something like that. But um, we can, by carefully looking at this photo, we can tell which people were engaged in making what sort of planes. So if I look at here and over here, I can see stacks of big, uh, long, square cross-section pieces of wood. And these would have been bench planes, the ones that were in constant use and they wore out. So there was always a ready market for these. On the other hand, moulding planes, because moulding planes really were made to order, they, they didn't keep many in stock because of the wide variety of shapes that, that could be had. And we'll see that in a minute. Uh, but this man here is making moulding planes because I can see a stack of them up here. And uh, on this side, I can see some pieces of wood which are going to be used to make the wedge of the plane, which is, which is the thing that actually holds the cutting iron in place. Uh, and it turns out actually that we in, in, in the Hawley collection have a lot of tools very similar to these, uh, and we could actually replicate one of these benches, and perhaps we hope to do that one day and, and give demonstrations and so on of actual plane making. That, that's the plan anyway. Now I mentioned that um, moulding planes could be used to make a wide variety of uh, moulding shapes or decorative shapes just to finish a piece of wood off. Um, there were over 500 uh, profiles listed in the catalogue and these are just some of them. Uh, the ones along the bottom here uh, would be for sash window frames. So um, in fact the, these these would have essentially a piece of glass which goes down the middle of that. But these planes could uh, do both the inside and the outside profiles of two pieces of wood. So when you join them together in a sandwich with the glass in the middle, then you had decorative moulding on each side of the glass. And that is just showing, the bottom ones there, just showing you what the final shape would be of the wood on either side of the glass. Uh, some of these other ones um, might be on the back of church pews or you know, any, anywhere where you needed some little decorative flourish on the wood. And as I say, a lot of these um, were, were made essentially to order. Um, but, but they could be had, you know, you could order them one day and they'd be ready the next day. It's it very quick um, because these were made in small numbers, typically. Whereas the big planes, the bench planes, were made in big numbers. Well, I now want to talk a little bit about the manufacturing process. I, I won't dwell on this too much, but I do have some uh, specimens over there 
Um, and I'm, I'm going to show you the photos of the, of the bits and pieces which show you the various steps in the process. And th I'll show you these to, so you can appreciate later on, if you look at those, the craftsmanship that goes into these things. Don't forget, each of these planes is ha handmade. There's no machine operations going on here. Everything is made by hand, individually. And it's quite a skilled job. Um, the French couldn't do it. They, they made planes in a different way, which was basically taking a load of bits of wood and gluing them together, because they couldn't do what we could do uh, with our plane-making people. So, essentially then, the, the plane, the side view of the plane looks like this. It's, as I said before, it's made of beech wood. And uh, the names of parts on this plane correspond to parts of a, of a foot, a human foot. So, the sole is the bottom of the plane, and this is where the uh, decorative moulding is actually put on and where the iron, the cutting iron, protrudes through to cut that particular shape you want into a, a piece of virgin wood. The front end is called the toe, which is convenient. When we have the heel, uh, the cutting iron is this thing here which goes all the way through the body of the plane and it's held in place with a wedge, a wooden wedge, which just, is just pushed in to, to keep the iron in place. Um, the body of, of the thing is actually called the stock. You don't have to remember all these, but I'm just, I'm just telling you them. And, and then the other things are, the, this is the bottom of the cutting iron down here, and this sits up against the bed. So this is um, essentially um, a slot which is cut into the side of the plane, and it's at a particular angle. And that angle varies according to how hard the wood is that you're actually trying to cut. So if it's very hard wood, that, that angle would be such that the iron would be almost vertical. If it's a very soft wood, it would be much, much tilted over. And then we have here something called the mouth, and that is where the shavings come out. As you, as you move your plane across the piece of wood, the shavings have got to come out somewhere, so they come out the side out of the mouth. So it's all sort of fairly self-explanatory as to what's going on. Right, so let's, let's go through a few stages then. Um, although planes were all made individually by hand, uh, there was a certain amount of standardisation involved in terms of the length of the planes and where the uh, holes in the plane were cut. And the reason for this is that um, you could buy these planes in sets uh, which were, use were useful for cutting um, various widths of wood. So you might get sets of anything up to 18 planes and number one in the set would be used for making very tiny uh, decorative features on a piece of wood and so the width of the plane might be an eighth of an inch or less. I'm sorry it's all in inches but that's how it was. Um, whereas number 18 in the set will be dealing with very wide pieces of wood to give you a very wide decorative moulding of the same shape but just much bigger in size. And of course if you bought a set of planes and it would cost you quite a lot of money to do that, you would like it to be a matched set. It would look nice on your bench. So this is why um, everything had to be marked out using a jig to start with to make sure that things did, although they're handmade, they looked fairly uh, similar to each other. So what we have here is, is a, a marking out jig. So the piece of wood which is going to be the plane has been cut roughly to length and roughly to the right cross-section dimensions. And that would be done using a circular saw. Now that was the only piece of mechanisation they had to, to just rough saw the wood into a, a approximately the right shape. And what you would then do is to put in a piece of wood into this um, marking gauge and uh, what you would do then is that you would mark out on the top of the piece of wood a couple of lines across there and those delineated where the hole in the top of the plane was going to go, the rectangular hole. And then you would mark the side of the piece of wood to show where the uh, mouth and the bed of the plane were going to be. And after that the craftsman was on his own uh, as to how he actually did the cutting out of the, of the various holes in that piece of wood. But, but that was the only standardisation that there was. So what we've got here is we've got three uh, samples really. Um, in fact, these were made by one of the plane makers just before he retired at, at Marples. 
um, Ken Hawley prevailed upon him to make him a set of demonstration pieces. And so the, these are uh, in the collection. So here's our, here's our original starting point. You might better see there's some pencil lines at the top there. What you can't see is that there are two that way as well. So they, they describe a rectangle. And, uh, OK, what, what the Carson's then done is to drill a circular hole through with a brace and bit by hand at the appropriate angle, which is not easy to do in itself. And then eventually that hole has been um, cut right through from the top to the bottom of the piece of wood to form the, the slot or the mortise into which the iron and the wedge are going to fit. And they've got to be a very tight fit for this thing to work properly. Now, don't forget this guy who's making these is on piece rates. So he's not going to spend a whole day making one plane. Uh, he, he might spend probably an hour, two, if it's a very complicated plane. But if it's like a bench plane, he probably can knock those off one every hour or every 40 minutes. So there's a lot of skill involved here. Right, so we've, we've now got... Um, We've assumed for the moment we've, he's cut the hole in the top, but we've now got to do the mouth. So he's, he's now cutting down this side. And then we show essentially the finished stock or body of the plane. So we've got the hole which comes right through, right through to the bottom. Uh, we've got the bed, got the mouth. And then he's finished off the side and uh, the top with chamfers to make it easier to hold. You, you don't want to be holding a piece of wood with very sharp edges on it. Um, so it, it's essentially just smoothed off a little bit to make it a, a bit easier to hold. The next thing you've got to do is to actually uh, put the shape of the moulding on the bottom of the plane. Now, this is the, if you like, the mirror image of the shape that you want the piece of wood that you're, you're, you're planing to end up looking like. So in this case, uh, the piece of wood, which we'll assume it's out here somewhere, it will have a nice flat piece and then drops down, then a curved bit and another bit on the edge. This is a bit like the old-fashioned skirting boards that you still see in, in houses. You don't see in really modern ones because they're a much simplified version. But if you look at sort of late Victorian Edwardian houses, you look at the skirting boards there, often they will have the top of the skirting boards finished with this sort of moulding. Now, these uh, profiles were cut into the base of our plane using a so-called mother plane. And this was, if you like, again, the mirror image of that. So the moulding on a mother plane would be the sh exact shape of what your finished piece of wood should look like. So we transfer the shape of that via the moulding, fine, via the mother plane onto our plane, and then this plane transfers it back again onto the piece of wood that you're actually planing. And, th and that's how you build up this profile. Because some of these planes had very intricate mouldings on the, on the bottom of the plane, um, parts of it were subject to excessive wear. And al although beech is a fairly hard wood, it won't stand up to you know, really uh, repeated use. And so sometimes on, on slightly more expensive planes, you could have an insert put in at the bottom of the plane at the point on the moulding uh, where there was the most wear likely to occur on the plane. And uh, these inserts were made of boxwood, which is a very, very slow growing uh, shrub or tree, and it's a very, very hard wood. So um, more expensive planes would, would have this as standard. If you wanted the very cheapest ones, it wouldn't have that in, and so the plane would wear out more quickly. So it's the old story, you get what you pay for. Really. We now come to uh, wedges. Now wedges are the things that are, are sat in the top of the plane body or stock, and these are the things that hold the cutting iron in place. And these were made from off-cuts basically, so they've got little bits of wood here, and they've been roughly cut into a sort of triangular shape. And um, Traditionally, uh, wedges have a notch in them. So we've, we've got some examples down here, and you'll better see them on the finished planes over there. Uh, and that notch, again, was partly decorative, uh, but it was also often used by people hitting the top of that notch with a hammer to remove the wedge. 
So if they wanted to resharpen the iron or something like that, they'd need to take the wedge out again. And it was simpler just to, to knock it out with that hammer. Um, but unfortunately, this meant that often the tops of the wedges get, get very damaged uh, or broken off altogether. Now, these wedges um, at Marples, that notch was always cut by a plane called a notching plane. And we have an example here, and there's, in fact, one, one on the bench over here you can see. Now, if you look at all, or if you look at many, probably most, if not all, of the Marples planes, the length and shape of that notch is identical, irrespective of when the plane was made. Now, when um, Marples took over John Mosley's in, in London, the, the, the company that had been going since 1730, they inherited all their plane making equipment. So they inherited all the mother planes for making the various mouldings and moulding planes, and they also inherited these notching planes. Now, in fact, we have two of these, and I have spent many happy hours looking through our entire stock of John Mosley planes. So all the mother planes we have that Marples used, and many other um, Mosley planes which go back to about 1740. And I've, I've checked all the wedges, the notches on the wedges, against these original notching planes. And I reckon every one of them was made by the, one of these two notching planes. So all the way back to 1730. Which is absolutely amazing to think that two planes like that have done so much work. OK, they would have had new cutting irons in them, but nevertheless, you know, they've played such a prominent part in making probably 50, 100, 200,000 planes over the years, maybe more. Absolutely amazing. Now, so you use, you use this notching plane to cut that, that initial shape of the, of the um, wedge, sorry, notch, uh, but then you've got to finish off the top of the wedge. You can, you can see here, this one's been rounded off. Now, that was, at Marples, that was done by the craftsman on an individual basis. Some companies, they had special planes to make that shape, but at Marples, they didn't, and each craftsman finished off the top of the wedges in his own particular style. Now, that is very significant because it's effectively like a signature, and we will use that fact later on uh, when we come to look at some planes. Now, the final thing we have to do, as far as the plane maker is concerned, is to actually fit an iron to the wooden stock, and the iron has to be ground to have the same profile as the profile that we've cut into the stock of the plane. And also, um, because the hole in the top of the plane was handmade, it's, it's a bit rough, so you have to probably do a little bit of filing there to make these irons fit snugly without wobbling about. So a certain amount of effort would have been required to actually fit the iron to the plane and also get the wedge uh, planed at the right sort of tapered angle down to make it fit snugly and hold the iron in place. So again, quite a fiddly job to do that, um, especially when you're working against the clock. Right, so those are the basic uh, techniques that were done. Um, now, at some stage, um, the iron, sorry, the planes, uh, I guess, would have gone into stock unless it was a special order and they were going straight out of the door. Um, and once they'd been in the, the warehouse a while and they were actually going to be shipped out, they would be marked. And they're marked on the end of the plane, the toe, the front end of the, the body of the plane. They're marked. And um, these marks um, varied with time. So, for example, if we look up here, uh, these would be planes which were <laughs> supposedly made by uh, Marples, sort of 1880, 1890, whereas in fact we know they were made in London. Um, whereas if we come up um, here, here, I think most of the planes that I've got over there for you to look at, I've probably got this mark on, which is probably towards the end of the time. Um, marks went in fashion and out of fashion. Uh, so this one here, um, they seem to be quite fashionable sort of in the 1930s or something like that, because a number of other companies had their own marks, which also had this sort of scroll pattern on them. 
and then that fashion changed again. So again, the, these all sort of pointers towards the date of manufacture of these planes. And then later on, right at the end of Marple's period, when they were making machine-made planes, um, then you will still find planes now which have this little mark on the end of the plane. And it says BB, which stands for Best Beach, but if you ever see one of those, it's a machine-made plane. It's not made by a craftsman. Uh, the craftsman might have sort of titivated a bit at the end, but uh, it was mainly made by machine-made parts. So you do still find quite a lot of those around. So the other thing is that we have records of when these marks, these trademarks, um, were registered um, by Marples. So I think the, trade, uh, the Trademarks Registration Act was 1876. Before that, um, trademarks, other, other marks, weren't, weren't registered. But after that time, trademarks normally were registered. And we have uh, big ledgers up in the collection which, which have sort of imprints of all these marks and the dates when they were registered and what the registration fee was, which is quite useful. So we have a lot of valuable information about um, dating planes, as it were. Now, I was searching through uh, our records one day when Ken Hawley was still alive, and um, he pointed me to a, a box file containing lots of bits of paper. And inside this box were two small pieces of paper with little handwritten scribbles on. And these were, to me, uh, it made me feel like Howard Carter when he first looked at the uh, tomb of Tutankhamun because these were uh, absolute gold dust. And what they are is that they are a suggestion that some of these planes were marked with craftsmen's marks as well as the company mark. And it starts to give me a clue as to the names of these people who had these marks. And there's another piece of paper which you'll see in a minute, but, but this enabled me to immediately start to find people's names, and in some cases I was able to assign a mark. Now, the thing I didn't say was that uh, probably between about 1909, when they really got going in Sheffield making planes, up to about 1960, um, it seems as though there was a new management sort of technique going on, time and motion and all this stuff, and quality control. And they got the plane makers to mark each plane that they made with their own individual mark. And so these are some of the marks that you may find on Marple's planes. You can only find them if you're looking for them. You will never see them otherwise. They're not meant to be seen by the customer. They're only meant to be seen uh, for two reasons. One, if the plane was faulty and the customer returned it, you could say who'd made that plane and so uh, tell them off. Um, or at the end of the week, you could count up the number of planes with a particular mark on and you knew how many planes somebody had made. They were on piece rates, so you knew how much to pay them. So it wasn't there really for vanity from the point of view of the, of the plane maker himself. It was there for administrative reasons really, reasons, really. But to us, if you're trying to do research on planes, it's an absolute gold mine. So this was one of the pieces of paper uh, I was uh, shown. And this was the other one. Um, now, the two, um, the two pieces of paper don't quite correspond, but they're close enough that, uh, again, uh, we have certain names appearing on this and the marks. Now, these marks look sort of rather peculiar. Why, why did they choose these marks? Um, well, there's a good reason for that, as there always is in these things. And that is that if you look in the, the Marple's trade catalogues, around about 1900, a bit later perhaps, you will find that one of the things they sold were sets of punches. These were decorative punches which are used in wood carving. When you're carving wood and you've got a big expanse of wood somewhere on the surface that you don't know what else to do with, uh, you might want to just put some texture on it. And so what you would do is buy a set of these punches 
and you then just go over the surface and just, just put a bit of texture on. And lo and behold, it turns out that in this set of uh, punches that you buy, there are a lot of marks that we've just seen on the previous pieces of paper. So we've got a star, um, we've got uh, this one looks like a bit like a curly X, we've got a thistle, we've got a shamrock, a diamond. So ding, 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 we're talking about diamonds in this talk. Uh, we've got an acorn and we've got many others. So this is significant because we already know that some of these planes are marked and this gives us an idea of all the possible marks that might have been used. I'm not saying that they all were, but they were, they were potential candidates for marks on Marple's planes. We want to find out a bit more about these names that we've uncovered so far. And we are incredibly fortunate in the Hawley collection in that we have, to the best of my knowledge, the only union records for uh, people who belong to the Plain Makers Union. I'm pretty certain that no one else in the country has any records relating to the Plain Makers Union. And this was formed in three branches by people in Bristol, Birmingham and Sheffield. So in, in the early 1900s, these were th really probably three of the most significant um, plane making towns, if you like, in, in the country. And so um, I think uh, the Bristol and Birmingham plane makers had already been organised, but when Marples got into the plane making business and recruited plane hands from elsewhere, uh, they decided to set up a Sheffield branch. And this is the inaugural uh, Union Dues book, which dates from, as we can see, November 1909. Now this is a book in which they recorded the names of all the union members in the Sheffield branch and how much they paid each week, which again tells us a lot because it tells us how many plane makers they had and um, as we shall see, it also tells us where they came from because most of them, if not all of them, were not Sheffield people, they, they were imports. So this is the first page in that book. Uh, it's very hard to read, I appreciate from your point of view, but it gives you the date, November, December, and then successive pages go month by month. And they give us some names up here, one or two of which we've already seen in the previous lists. But there are some at the bottom here, which are members of the Bayliss family, B-A-Y-L-I-S-S. Now these people, um, as we will see in a minute, came from Birmingham. So they were already probably making planes in Birmingham and then they were uh, offered better salaries and so they came to join the Marples plane making outfit. Now the interesting thing is, we can check that in a way because on this side the first entry is an entrance fee to the union, your joining fee. And these three people at the bottom, the Bayless family, did not pay that. They, they were exempt. And that indicates to me that they were already members of the union in Birmingham. Whereas everyone else had to pay a joining fee of two and sixpence. So that's, you know, that's an interesting sort of thing. Amongst the other pieces of gold mine in, in, the, in uh, Tutankhamun's tomb, which I'll call it, um, were two other pieces of paper, again sort of scrap bits of paper, just ripped off a, a, a roll or something, brown paper perhaps, or just a bit off a desk. It gives names and it gives where these people came from. So in fact there is one there who's come from Sheffield, but Bayless, Birmingham. Then we've got uh, Tommy Newhall who we'll meet later on, he came from Newcastle on Tyne. Uh, we've got somebody from Glasgow, now there was a big plane making company in Glasgow um, and, and we won't talk, them, talk about them here, but we know, we know something about them, in fact quite a lot. So, you know, we've got a lot of information now. We've got people's names, we know where they came from, which means that we could now, if you wanted to, go to Ancestry.com and start to find out about these people, where they came from, what they did, what their ante antecedents were. Right, well, this is another page from the uh, Union Juice book for 1910. And there's a period here 
where no union uh, dues were paid. And that's because the plane makers at Marples were on strike. So they were on strike from December 1909, in other words, shortly after the union had been formed, uh, until 1910. Now, whether this was because Marples uh, uh, locked them out uh, because they didn't want a union to be formed, I, I don't know. I've searched all the local newspapers for the period, and one of the Sheffield newspapers dealt a lot with union matters, and I can't find any mention of that strike. Uh, I would love to know why they came out on strike, but it's something which I don't know about. But it's all recorded in this little book. Right, well, let's now turn to uh, some of the actual people and, and try and establish a little bit about them. Uh, obviously, the Bayliss family, we know there were three of them at that stage. And in fact, there were more. Um, and, and they were several generations. So obviously, they were a dynasty of plane makers, you know, father, son, and so on. Um, and so I was able to um, do some research on the Bayliss family and, and ultimately make a family tree uh, of, of them. And there's quite a few of them. But luckily, Ken had interviewed um, the last Bayliss who worked at Marples when he retired in 65. Um, and these are just some highlights in his career. So he started as an apprentice in 1935, and he was making moulding planes, uh, and he was working under his father. So we know that um, Norman Jesse was the son of Jesse. So Jesse had been working um, at Marple since 1909. So we've got the makings of a dynasty now. Um, Norman went off to, off to the war, but his father's mark was two diamonds. So those diamonds, it's, it's just made with one punch, punch twice. Now we don't know whether that meant that his real mark was an eight, or whether it was actually two diamonds, but we'll assume it was two diamonds. So his father marked his planes with two diamonds. And when his father retired, Norman was the last man making moulding planes at Marples. And he inherited his father's mark. Now, there's some subtlety in this, as we'll see in a minute. 1965, moulding planes finished making them. So that was the end of an era. Right, so let's have a quick look now at some planes. These are two planes made by father and son. Now, when I first started looking at these planes and examining them, I realised, obviously, from what I've said before, that some of the planes from Marples that we had in the collection, and in fact, some that I have in my own collection, um, were marked with a double diamond. But it was only much later that I realised, after examining these through a lens, that the marks, although they, father and son had double diamond as their mark, the marks were different. And so I was able to work out which planes had been made by the father and which planes had been made by the son. So that was the first breakthrough. The second breakthrough is that I said earlier that when they made the wedges, each craftsman was allowed to finish off the top of the rounded top of the wedge in his own style. If you look at these two planes, the style of the wedges, the notch is the same. This one looks a bit battered, but the notch is the same. But the top of the wedge is different. And you'll see that again if you look at some of the planes that I have over here for you to look at. Now, the other thing I will say is that these marks are not meant to be seen by you, the customer. So they were always traditionally marked right at the very top of the stock, immediately in the sort of shadow caused by the wedge and the iron. So this sort of angular space here is often in shadow. You can't see into it, really. And that's where they put these marks. They weren't to be seen by the customer. Well, here's some close-ups of marks, and these were very difficult to photograph. They're tiny, they're probably of the order of an eighth of an inch by an eighth of an inch, something like that. And the difference between them in dimensions is, is, you know, 30 seconds of an inch. It's very tiny. 
But if you look carefully, you'll see that here the diamonds are of a different shape to those. So this is the father, this is the son. So that and the shape of the wedge tops is how we can identify between father and son. And this is another shot of, of wedges by father and son. So this is the father. The length of that wedge notch is the same in each case because it's been cut with the same notching plane that I mentioned much earlier. But again, if you look at the style at the back here, it's different. And you'll see that when you look at the, the real planes. It's quite distinct. You can have a row of planes and you can easily pick out, oh, those are made by the sun because it's so distinctive. It's the sort of thing where you have to have your eye in, but once you've looked at several thousand planes, you begin to <laughs> see these minor points. I'm sorry it sounds a bit sad, but... Uh, with the union records, um, I was able to use ancestry then, uh, and knowing where these people were born, I was able to use ancestry to gradually build up a family tree of the Bayless family. Uh, Charles Bayliss, as far back as I've gone so far, he was a nail maker in the black country. Now, I guess when that nail making business started to go down the tubes, because nails no longer were then handmade, they started to be machine made, so that trade dropped out, really. So I, I would guess that they somehow got into making planes, uh, in, and, and this would be in Birmingham. Um, and so we have... Uh, Ebenezer Bayliss, now he, he, I think, worked for a little while at Marples and then went back to Birmingham. But uh, here's the father that we're talking about on the previous slide, and here's the son, the last one who actually made planes. But there's also another part of the tree, um, and these were making planes in Birmingham. So the whole family was at it, basically. They, you know, both sides of the family were, were making planes. And, and again, two sort of dynasties of people. So it's quite fascinating to, to realise that this is what happened. And I can only assume that if you look at Sheffield tool making in general, there must have been dynasties, father, son, and so on, you know, down through the years. And it would be fascinating to do research in that area, but it's not for me to do that. So here's, here's Norman Jesse, the last plane maker. Um, Ken, as I said, did a, a, an oral interview with him and he also had the foresight to make some cine film of, his act, of him actually making planes. And so he's at the bench here um, making a plane. I think this was actually done in Ken's garage. I think he mocked up a plane making bench and everything and, and took some cine film, as Ken would do. Um, but obviously, as I said, after 1965, the planes were made by machine. Um, machinery rather than by hand. I said there were other Bayless plane makers, so we've got um, the Birmingham lot, and in fact, um, there, there's the mark of one of the Birmingham plane makers. So that was uh, Arthur Ernest Bayless. So, you know, that's again confirmation of what I said in the, um, in the family tree. Right, well, let's, let's move on to a couple of our other characters. I'm just aware that this is a picture of the plane makers department um, at Marples in about 1920. Um, we can see there's quite a lot of presumably apprentices at the bottom here and uh, we assume that most of these people actually made planes but the guy on the left is obviously the boss isn't he because he's got a suit on um, but some of these might have worked in the stock room and so on you know things like that so but it's if you look at this photo carefully and you look at the photo I showed you much earlier of the, of the men actually working in the plane making shop, I reckon you can see one or two faces on those, you know, which are similar on those two pictures. But the person I'm interested in is this one here. Now, I didn't know anything about him, but um, we had a visit one day some years ago from someone who came in and said, oh, my grandfather used to work at Marples. And so I got this photo out and he looked at it and he said, I think that is my grandfather. Now, so I know the name of this person, it was, it was Mr Newell. He provided us with a photo of his grandfather, obviously togged up in his, uh, I don't know if he was 21 at the time and he had his photo taken, you know, looking very grand. 
But if you look at the two faces, I'm pretty certain it's the same person. So we're fairly certain then that this is um, Tommy Newhall. His mark was this sort of curly X. We know that from the other records we've got. He joined Mar uh, Marples in 1913. And so we know another name, another face. And then the last one I'm going to talk about is Albert Bock. Now, he was the last person at Marples who made bench planes, the big made of all work planes. And um, he joined uh, from Birmingham and he joined after the First World War. And so he retired um, just around about 1966, 67, something like that. Um, he stopped making uh, bench planes. There's one there he's got. He's got a row of them there he's in the process of making. He stopped making these around about uh, 1960. Well, he says he retired in 63, so I can't be making much after that, can he? But, so they obviously stopped making bench planes by that stage, or at least by hand. Um, again, this, I think, is a mock-up of a plane maker's bench. But we actually have, I suspect, most of these hand tools, the gouges, chisels, files and things in, in, in our stock. And so we could put those together now and re, you know, reconstitute that bench, uh, which would be historically correct. So we're so fortunate in the stuff that Ken Hawley actually saved for us when the Marples uh, factories closed down in Sheffield. Well, I'm still trying to do research on, on to try and identify other people. And I'm, and I'm hoping at some stage that someone's going to come forward and say, oh, my grandfather works there and his name was so-and-so. And we might then be able to fill in a bit more of the puzzle. Uh, I live in hope. But the other interesting thing is that uh, I do look at other tools in the collection. And for two years, I spent looking at Boxford rules, folding rules that every joiner used to have in his pocket. And some of those are marked with... Uh, craftsman's marks. If you look hard enough, they're not meant to be seen, but they're there. And you'll find that other uh, makers from other companies around the country, again for a period, their plane hands marked their planes. Either with a letter, perhaps, in the case of uh, one of the companies in York, or numbers in the case of a company in Glasgow. And so you can be uh, like a train spotter, especially with the numbers, and you, you can go around and look at planes in antique centres and say, oh, that's the number 63, I haven't got that one. You can tick it off your list. <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't have records which enable me, because they don't exist, to enable me to put those numbers or letters to names. The records aren't there, unfortunately. Um, and spoke shades as well. Um, you'll find some spoke shades uh, they're all tools which use wood as well as metal in their construction. And it's always the wood which is marked. And the marks are always very tiny. Unless you look for them, you won't ever see them. And as I said before, these were used for quality control and because of workers on peace rates. Well, in conclusion, I'd say basically then the Hawley collection is a fascinating collection to work with. I only work one day a week. Um, but... Uh, it's not just about hand tools, it's about the people as well. Because of the records we have, it's about the people. And of course, it's about Sheffield's history. Um, so we, we try and fill in a bit of the picture, which most people would have you know, thought was not important in the past. Well, in conclusion, I'd say basically then the Hawley collection is a fascinating collection to work with. I only work one day a week. Um, but... Uh, it's not just about hand tools, it's about the people as well. Because of the records we have, it's about the people. And of course, it's about Sheffield's history. Um, so we, we try and fill in a bit of the picture, which most people would have you know, thought was not important in the past. Some people, some sad people like me, collect antique wooden planes. Now, they're fascinating for many reasons. But they're not rare. Uh, if, if you look at antique dealers and, and so on, they'll say, oh, this is very rare. You know, we're going to charge you lots of money for these. You look on eBay and some of the prices on there are ridiculous. They are not rare. At least a million were made in this country, I would think, at least over a 300-year period. And especially moulding planes, many of those have survived. 
for the reasons I mentioned earlier. What each of these planes is unique. It's marked with a company name, like Marples or whoever. It may well have a personal mark of the person who made it. It's made of its own unique piece of wood with its own grain and everything on it. And usually they will have lots of other marks on them who are owner's marks. Because if you were a woodworker, a carpenter or something like that, and uh, you had your, your tools stolen, unless they were marked with your name, the union would not pay you money to replace them. So the first thing, if you got a plane, you might have bought it second hand from a, you know, the estate of a deceased plane maker, or you might have bought one new. The first thing you did was get your own personal mark and bang it on the plane. So you'll see lots of old planes with four, five, six, seven marks on, and they're all people's names. So that may be the only record of their existence that still is there. Otherwise, they're totally forgotten. So the owner's marks themselves are very interesting. And, and if you're really into this, you can go around collecting planes with, from one particular owner and try and build up a set of his tools. That's hard, but you can do it if you're really, you know, that's so engrossed. And the other thing I would say then is some of these go back to 1750, 1740, and you can still see them around quite frequently of that age. Some of them are still in pristine condition as they were made because they've never been used for some reason or another. Others will be well used. But the prices you pay in antique centres, £5, £10, where else can you buy antiques of 250, 300 years old for that price, which is a unique item? I don't think you can. I thought it was wise to say something about the first Sheffield plane makers. Uh, Sheffield didn't really get into making wooden planes until the early 1800s because previously they'd been brought in from elsewhere, probably York or Hull um, and London as we've seen earlier. Um, but 1814 is the earliest that we know of um, that a, a wooden plane was totally made in Sheffield by somebody called Burton. And then the next one that I can find is somebody called Mr Young with an E, uh, 1821. We have examples of both these in the collection. The one at the bottom is in phenomenal unused condition. It has never been used. It looks, it doesn't look like it came out of the factory because it's got a bit of a nice polish on it now because it's been conserved, but it has never been used. There are no marks on it from hammers or anything. And, and you can still find planes like that in antique centres. And five pounds. That's the fascination of it for me. Uh, this is an example of one which was made in about 1780 in York by a company called John Green. John Green was a well long established firm in York. The reason I put this on is it's got a couple of owner's marks on the, on the end. So, so there's the company mark and those are the owner's marks. So, you know, that's, that's another fascination. Right, well, thank you for listening. <laughs>